Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation. That's my first KITP seminar. It's uh, being a beautiful week here discussing with everybody. Um, my name is Nasser Galul. I'm working, I'm, I'm leading the theory of quantum sensing group at the Institute of Quantum Optics in the Leibniz University of Hanover. I think this clicker is not, not going to click. So I'll start with um, some introductions and motivation um, to uh, the problem of basically doing atom interferometry with quantum gases. Uh, I will talk about mainly two axes that we are, we are pushing. Uh, uh, one is a block powered atom interferometry and the second is sending atom interferometers to space. Our motivations are uh, the same than everybody here, I guess, this week, uh, which is understanding better these almost 95% of the universe uh, that, that we are not uh, capturing. Our angle of attacking this problem is not uh, testing dark matter, dark energy models, but we are starting with uh, GR and uh, attacking basically the very uh, fundamentals of GR, uh, basically the um, um, equivalence principle of Einstein, which is a hypothesis, it's not a theorem or anything. And it's expected to be violated in all theories that are actually going uh, beyond the standard model trying to find dark energy and uh, dark matter. So we would like to really see if we can detect a violation of this theory that we know very well and uh, that is, is pretty popular. Uh, more specifically, we would like to look at the weak equivalence principle or uh, the free universality of free fall. So comparing the free fall of two objects uh, and um, comparing these accelerations of these two bodies in an, a gravity field and detecting if uh, this parameter, which is called the Erdfusch parameter, is non-zero. So that's the principal test of uh, the equivalence principle. These are very different ways to test it, uh, either in torsion balances in Washington in lunar laser ranging or the state of the art at 10 to the minus 15 set by the microscope mission on a satellite but with classical bodies. Uh, and we would like to achieve uh, a better level uh, of this test basically with quantum, um, let's say quantum, inter quantum tests or comparing the free fall of two quantum bodies rather than uh, two classical tests. The state of the art, uh, here is a long list of, of performances, but the state of the art right now is at Stanford in the experiment of Mark Kasevich at the level of the 10 to the minus 12 with uh, comparing the free fall of rubidium 85 and 87. We'd like to go to 10 to the minus 15 or 10 to the minus 17 rather. Um, so, a motivation, a big motivation of my work is also at the moment less fundamental. It is about Earth observation. So this is something that is uh, starting recently, but is gaining a lot of momentum. I, I, I mean, I'm not going to discuss here uh, why um, or how we are doing this, but just to flash this uh, for this community, I think uh, you should know that the geophysics community starts to be very interested in uh, what they call quantum space gravimetry, because qu like the quantum sensors um, or atom interferometers, to be more precise, are absolute uh, tests or absolute uh, sensors of gravity compared to, uh, let's say, classical electrostatic uh, device that, that sense the gravity and uh, have like huge drift times uh, where they need to be recalibrated and so on and so forth. So this is, uh, something that is uh, moving on at the moment to, to have better resolutions in space and in time to access some uh, new phenomena in geophysics. At, the, at this very moment, there is an uh, EU consortium which is very active building the engineering model of uh, this kind of interferometers. It's called Carioca and it's going to be in orbit for uh, a quantum pathfinder mission by 2030. So this is for our colleagues from NASA, I think an interesting uh, information. But let's come back to the fundamental physics. So this is how a Marzender interferometer is working to detect basically G, if we are interested in this accelerometer. So you have a beam splitter, a mirror, and another beam splitter, and 
by playing with the phase, for example, of one of these lasers, we can create uh, different populations in the two ports. We count these atoms by counting these atoms or this probability. We can get to the dephasing between these two arms. If there is any due to, for example, an external force, we can write these beautiful scaling laws and uh, then we get this, uh, the, the G, for example, because we know the dephasing, we know the K effective of light, and we know the time that we are putting inside our interferometer. If we repeat this twice, simultaneously in the same device with two species, then we can realize the UFF test, so we can compare the accelerations uh, in principle different of the two bodies by comparing the two delta phi's and so on and get to the it for ratio. So that's uh, pretty easy to understand. Now, how can we get beyond the state of the art? There are two ways to do this. There are actually three, but two very popular and major ways. One is if you look at the scaling, uh, you see that the measurement sensitivity depends on T square. So you'd like to push T. Okay? Second way is you'd like to make this k effective n times k effective. So if k effective was 2h per k in a Raman process, for example, you'd like to do n times this process. And this is the business of what we call large momentum transfer. So we'd like to transfer a maximum number of photons uh, to the system. The third way that I did not list there is the squeezing uh, way with, where, where people uh, are very active. We heard a fairly um, a uh, good amount of nice talks since yesterday about squeezing. Uh, we also active there. I have this proposal uh, with Luca and uh, Augusto and Robin Corgier about what we call the delta kick squeezing in free space, basically using the interactions of uh, in, a, in a BEC and creating uh, some kind of preparation state to inject to a squeeze state in this interferometer and uh, get to a nice, uh, let's say, degree of squeezing of the measurement. I'm not going to talk about this today. If you are interested, you could read our paper or talk to me later. What I would like to focus on are these two traditional methods of increasing the sensitivity. And let's start with the Bloch-powered atom interferometry. So this is the principle. Uh, in fact, in, as I said, instead of driving a 2H by K separated uh, two arms here of the interferometer, you just add some Bloch pulses. They here Bloch oscillations. Uh, these are the blue uh, regions here to, in, in, uh, to, to basically uh, impart uh, N uh, H bar K here and make this area bigger. This area, the space-time area, is exactly how your, how your statistical, uh, let's say, error is evolving at. So you are gaining if you, if you increase this number N to something like 500. So if you make 500 times 2h per k, then you actually gain 500 uh, in, a, in your sensitivity. But most interferometers operate at n equals 1. We will try to understand why that is. So um, using this principle, uh, we, for example, teamed up with the uh, team of Ernst Hasel in Hanover, and where they did this very beautiful experiment where they started with a source here. They did what we call double Bragg diffraction to initiate some splitting, and then they imparted uh, a fairly high number of Bloch, uh, uh, let's say, pulses. So here you could see the original you cannot see the, uh, yeah, I can see the original cloud, and then these separated clouds for different numbers of, uh, of pulses, basically, or of momenta, a couple of momenta, and they could do separations up to thousands of H bar K. And this was really remarkable. Uh, when they closed the interferometer, however, they could see contrast only after 408 H by K limited by the optical quality of the beams. We studied this, what you see here, these shaded areas are our theories. So we understand this, this is not a fundamental limit, this is rather basically the optical modes being not in a cavity, but in free space. Um, that's beautiful, but we asked ourselves the question with Clemens, this is work that we do together in collaboration in Hanover, why did people do not use this in metrology? I mean, this, is, this seems like working, and uh, it's really um, improving the sensitivity by a huge factor. And uh, we tried to look at the metrology of Bloch um, atom interferometers, where you are inserting basically these Bloch beams in the middle. 
after loading your optical lattice and uh, accelerating it for a time t and so on and so forth. So this is the ramp time. So we studied this problem. We found that um, the situation, the theoretical situation was not very satisfactory. What people used in um, many papers and uh, to understand few experiments was uh, basically some lambda Zener law uh, to explain um, the losses that happen in an optical lattice. If you plot things uh, in these uh, block bands, then what you are doing, every block oscillation is basically the atoms circulating uh, in this uh, Brillouin zone. Every time they, they, they are crossing one Brillouin zone, they gain to uh, H by K momentum. Yeah? And uh, you would like to stay in this fundamental band but you cannot avoid these Landau-Zener losses because atoms have a, non, uh, uh, yeah, a finite probability to tunnel to these, um, to these higher bands. And you could compute that with the uh, very famous Landau-Zener law and get to, to a number. But we are not interested at all in this regime. This is a regime of very shallow lattices. We want to, to be powerful. We want to imprint thousands of h by ks And this comes with very deep lattices of tens of e recoil in depth. And if you plot things here, then you see that your bands are getting completely flat, such that this law is not any more uh, applicable. And people know this. I mean, um, you, you find it uh, in, the, in the literature. Um, but there's, there was no scaling law, basically, for what could happen um, in this regime. So we looked at. Uh, what people did in solid state physics uh, and other fields, for example, in this uh, review paper. And we found that the better picture to approach the problem is to adopt a Van Stark state picture because these are delocalized states. So what we do is we rewrote our Hamiltonian in the uh, lattice frame. So it's then the problem gets very simple. Uh, you, it's, it's kind of your atoms are suspended by this tilted lattice. So the tilt comes from the acceleration. And uh, then you see that you populate these Vanier Stark states here, but they are fundamentally lossy. So they have a finite probability to tunnel. So they have these very long tails. So if you write your Hamiltonian, you will have the energy of these Vanier Starks, uh, the tilt, and this complex term here, which is uh, basically reflecting these losses. So these are states with a finite lifetime. Now, you make everything very clean uh, in your experiment, and you load uh, these, uh, your lattice with, uh, at, the, at the fundamental band by doing uh, an adiabatic loading, basically by making the ramp here very smooth and not kind of a box shape. But still, this is, this is the state, uh, the time-dependent state. It has a phase which is proportional to the energy of the Vanier Stark, E00. Let's say you, you, you did uh, land in the fundamental band. Uh, this is the tilt we can ignore, but you have these losses. And we are interested in looking at the time evolution of that state. Um, let me say that we compare everything to an exact solution that comes from a numerical tool that we have at our disposal, which we call a universal atom interferometer simulator. This is something we developed a few years ago in order to make le like the minimum number of approximations in the problems of atom interferometry. You heard it this morning by Saida, like uh, spatially dependent uh, K vectors, uh, then uh, we, heard, we heard it by Tim uh, in the long baselines, like uh, atoms exploring. Um, the light field and so on. What we do is we don't look at the momentum states. We solve the problem completely in position space. We can input here any time dependent, spatially dependent uh, Rabi frequencies, any time dependent, spatially dependent momentum. We solve this equation. We look our, our, so we treat the atom light interaction as an external potential. This potential is described here. These are the pulses. This will be a pi over two, pi, pi over two and we look at what we obtain. And we were very surprised when we did this. So for example, we did the very simple uh, bragg uh, machtsender interferometer, and then immediately you see all of these parasitic paths. And these are, these are not problems, these are features of this simulation. So you, in this simulation, you see exactly 
everything as it happens in the experiment. We checked that uh, we are not doing any, any errors, so our numeric, numerical noise is below the 10 to the minus 13 radians, so it sh should be fine for, for metrology. Nowadays, we accelerate all of this with GPU calculations and so on. We do study this in 3D, we have the full features. Coming back to the problem of Bloch, we will compare everything to this method to be sure that our analytical model is working. Um, I should say, Everything is analytical, except of the calculation of the Vanier Stark letters, which is like a diagonalization simple problem. But as soon as you did this, everything is analytical. Let's come back to the problem. So suppose we are in the uh, blue state here. There's, so we would like to be in the blue letter. But there is a number of resonant tunnelings, for example, from this blue state to this one here, or from this blue state to this orange state. This is known as resonant tunneling in, in optical lattices. And this will cause for different accelerations here. So this is uh, acceleration, more acceleration means more tilt. And uh, you'll see that these resonances, for example, A, B, C, these cases, uh, will result in a, in a sharp peak in the losses that uh, you would see, okay? So we calculate that. We calculated, uh, for example, for a thousand H bar K momentum transfer. That's what we are after. We are after increasing um, these sensitivities by factors of thousand. And we look at the probability, at the losses, basically. Uh, and we see this as a function, again, of the accelerations. And we see, uh, we see a very complex, basically, landscape. So we think that this is, you should, as an experimentalist, take these tools and look at exactly where you operate because you don't want to operate next to a, a peak of these losses. Um, to, for, as a guide, like the dashed stuff here is um, the Landau-Zener formula and it's off by many orders of magnitude just as uh, one would expect. Now, we would like to construct the interferometer so we can see what, we, what we've done so far as one arm. Now you are going to put the other arm of the interferometer uh, we write this formula again, and we write the phase out uh, of, of or the phase difference between these two arms. It will depend on this energy and on the Bloch uh, time, which is just a constant for some configuration. We divide this phase by n, the number of Bloch oscillations, and we are asking ourselves the question, what is the phase error that I am doing um, if my, my energy here, if, if I have, for example, amplitude fluctuations in the power which are not symmetric between the two arms. That's what happens mostly in experiments. And uh, we've calculated then the derivative of, of this energy. So say that you have this asymmetry. We normalized it by the number of Bloch oscillations. And this is the delta V over V0. This is the level of fluctuation. Okay, if that number is, say, 10 to the minus 3, meaning that you just did not uh, basically guarantee the symmetry between your two arms to a 10 to the minus 3 level. That's what you get. It's normalized by n. And we plotted this whole quantity here, which would be the phase error that you will have after this interferometer or the phase diffusion. The bad news is that the scale is in radian. So that's actually pretty touchy. Um, for any, any depth that you are looking at. So you have to be, for example, let's say, what does this mean? It means that uh, if, you, if you have a control at the 10 to the minus 3 level and you want to imprint thousands of Bloch oscillations, this is, you are going to have a one radiant error at the end. That's really not good. So this number has to be pushed down. We studied with this a lot of cases uh, or famous ca and useful cases in the literature. So we looked at the um, one minute coherence time of Holger Müller uh, in Berkeley, uh, where he levitates atoms basically uh, in this Bloch lattice. This is exactly the same problem. It's not, uh, it's not a spatial, uh, let's say, uh, spatial separation, but these atoms, in order to be levitated, gravity needs to be compensated. So it's getting uh, a certain number of, of photons. And 
we asked ourselves, okay, um, what would be, why, why is he uh, having one minute and not two and not uh, one second? And if you put um, the problems that he has in his experiment, which is the jitter in the optical axis of the cavity, this is really small, but it's um, for this uh, actually quite a long time, it introduces a little asymmetry between the two um, uh, intensities of the two, these two arms. So even being an, in a cavity and having the control of delta V over V uh, of the order of five, 10 to the minus seven, if you put everything in, in our formula, you get a delta phi of 0 0.6 radians. And this is already causing uh, the contrast loss. So that's that we were very happy to see that this uh, works, at least for our formula, uh, and that uh, the way to go is, is clear. Um, we've looked at what you would need for an H over M measurement uh, at the 10 to the minus nine level, uh, then you need a delta, delta phi of one millirad, and uh, this is the level that you would need to assure in, in terms of, uh, of symmetry. And we looked at the very, let's say, involving problem of uh, observing gravitational waves with atom interferometers and what it means and it means that if you want to access these strain sensitivities of the 10 to the minus 21, uh, you need uh, delta phi to be not more than the micro radiant level, then you need your both uh, arms to be at uh, the same intensity to the 10 to the minus nine level. So these are pretty scary messages, but better, uh, one is better knowing about them and, and uh, do, do the homework before. Okay, so that was uh, the block-powered atom interferometry. Um, I'm going to talk about the efforts uh, in the space sector now. So let's say we would like to, to look at these interferometers, uh, for example, at an interferometer that uh, works at 10 to the minus 15 level with rubidium 85 and 87. Why do I care about going to space? If I look at my sensitivity in G and plug in typical numbers, 10 to six atoms here, uh, 2h bar uh, k of, of rubidium uh, and look at what is the T that I would need there. I would need a T which is giving me a single short sensitivity which is at the 10 to the minus 12 um, G per square root of Hertz in order to be able to integrate basically in something like not more than several months. Otherwise, everything that we are uh, talking about is not reasonable. If you look at T in this X axis, you will find that this T is a couple of seconds. So this is why we care about these couples of, of seconds. How do you get the seconds in free fall? You get them if you go to drop towers or fountains, you, or if you are on the ISS, in, high, in parabolic flights, in sounding rockets, and in satellites with different micro G quality and different uh, micro G durations. So this is ultimately what you like. You like to be on a satellite because you have a very clean environment of 10 to the minus 6 G and you have years where uh, you could do your experiments. So there are other solutions. So Tim talked about uh, long baselines as we have in Hanover here that would offer you a 2T of one second in drop mode and 2.5 in uh, launch mode here. Uh, uh, there are other fountains in Wuhan in China and, uh, of course, the Stanford experiment. There is also the Einstein elevator uh, facility in Hanover that you see here, which is uh, quite good, uh, I think, as a facility giving four seconds of microgravity for something like 300 shots a day uh, for a height of 40 meters. Uh, the good thing about it is, is, is it's a facility, so it's takes one ton of experiment, you come, put your experiment, you shoot it 300 times a day, you take it out, the next customer comes, and so on and so forth. So we have uh, quite a good, uh, let's say, so the DESIRE experiment is, for example, uh, NASA DLR um, uh, collaboration here. We, we would have uh, more, uh, I hope, in the next, uh, in the next years. Um, but we care about going to space because we think this is giving us more uh, than these four seconds or whatever number of seconds that we can have on ground. We think we can have these platforms under control. Right now, the space business is 
quite um, mature, uh, basically, after LISA, Pathfinder, and Microscope. We, can, we know that we can access platforms with a drag-free, at, controlled at the 10, 10 to the minus 18 level. And we, we do have quite a fair heritage from Earth observation um, experiments. One very big motivation that uh, I like uh, to, to emphasize when you go to space is to have a very typical, if you are looking at gravity, you have a very typical um, signal modulation. So if you, if you are looking at a little g here and the axis of your interferometer is kept uh, in inertial mode, so always pointing in the same direction, then the, your signal will be modulated around, along the orbit. You can never get something like this on Earth. And this will give you this very typical modulation that will be different from anything that happens on your apparatus, say, self-gravity or uh, magnetic fields or so on. So this is, if, if in the precision measurement business, this is very important. Um, when we talk about having an object and a quantum object and observing it for a couple of seconds, I think there is no way around using the BEC. This is why all we've done in the last years was study BECs. Simply, if you take it from the size perspective and look at the size of uh, an ensemble of condensed atoms, after two seconds, you see that it's something like the millimeter if it's a BEC and it's completely uh, out of, of, let's say, the interesting range for any other regime. So I think we should not talk uh, and think about any other um, other regime. This uh, endeavor started uh, in, in a DLR, German Space Agency powered consortium around the year 2004 and is still continuing and uh, thanks to this um, very, uh, let's say, sustainable support, uh, this uh, consortium of universities led by Ernst Hasel in Hanover could uh, miniaturize the BECs to make them machines that are able, for example, in this first generation to be put in a drop tower. This is a, the Zahn drop tower in Bremen and launched there or dropped there for a free fall of 4.7 seconds. So um, this showed the first BEC in microgravity, then there were other generations. The Qantas II experiment was smaller and uh, lighter and could be uh, basically manipulated in, uh, in the catapult mode. Uh, so you could create four uh, BECs in one shot, uh, as you could see here, uh, in the nine seconds of the catapult. Uh, a number of research on, on uh, basically getting to, to uh, the very nice limits we would like to, to achieve in terms of expansion energies were made. So this is a record expansion of only 38 uh, pico k in 3D for this BEC. This is a quantum object that you could almost see with your naked eye after two seconds of free evolution. Then the more involving uh, and space experiment started with Myos-1, where a comparable, uh, let's say, device was put in on, the, on board of this sounding rocket. and. This was launched uh, in 2017 here in Esrange in Sweden. Uh, and uh, here you see that uh, where is the space line, yeah, the Kármán line is here, 100 kilometers. And experiments were even done in this boost phase. Uh, you see the magneto optical trap working. And then uh, shortly after the first BC in space was made, um, so, and then uh, a bunch of other experiments were made here in the six minutes of microgravity, including atom interferometry, as you could see here in these beautiful fringes recorded uh, of this interferometer published in that paper. Um, this is a fairly robust experiment. I like to always show this picture. This, uh, the device uh, came back to Earth on, parach on a parachute mode and was uh, lying down in the snow there on the North Pole, nobody could go and fetch it because it was the weather conditions were so bad uh, that uh, for three days it was just there and the team could, could recover it uh, after these three days at minus 35 degrees. Only after minor repairs they could get the BEC back. So that, that stuff is pretty, pretty robust at the moment. One of the very nice um, steps that, that uh, we had later is uh, participating to the uh, CAL adventure through the 
participation in the uh, Nick Vigelow Consortium. Here's the Cal device uh, unpacked, which made the first BEC in orbit. We made a number of experiments uh, on this device, including this one is one of my favorite experiments, shuttling a BEC here for almost uh, a millimeter and controlling its position to the nanometer level. This is very comparable to what people do in ions for quantum information, for example, but we are doing here, we are doing it here with something like tens of thousands of atoms and uh, with a full BEC uh, in, this in these traps with vanishing frequencies. We did also uh, delta kick uh, collimations to the same level of 50 pico K. Uh, at the moment, we are doing interferometry experiments, uh, or not at the moment, at the moment there's a new unit being plugged there, but shortly before this new unit was, uh, was sent, um, uh, the first uh, mixture of uh, potassium and rubidium BECs was made uh, in space, and here you see the results that are on this archive paper that should appear in nature any time now. Uh, I hope I showed you all of this to convince that um, we, we have achieved quite a good control of, uh, on, on quantum gases in space at the micrometer, micrometer per second level, tens or hundreds of micrometers per second expansions, and uh, we start controlling the mixture in order to do these UFF tests. Now, I'm going to finish with the UFF test and uh, take one step further. It's going to take a minute. Um, so this is a proposal within the, um, what we at, uh, ESA calls the Voyage 2050. This is the space program of ESA to uh, basically the science program. And we had uh, an exercise very comparable to what we, we are experiencing here with the decadal. Uh, we did produce this road map in 2022. This is representing something like 250 active researchers in the field, and we've put our priorities here together on this map. And here you see the Earth observation missions, here you see ST Quest to be launched on 2037, uh, something like this. So what is ST Quest? ST Quest is this mission comparing the free fall of rubidium and potassium on a satellite to the 10 to the minus 17 level. It was competing for an M-class mission. M-class missions at ESA are something like half a billion uh, euros. Um, and yes, the idea is to go to the sensitivity of 10 to the minus 17 in the universality of free fall. By the way, this would correspond to these five orders of magnitude that were in the decadal uh, yesterday. Uh, if Mark Kasevich stops working uh, in Stanford. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't only looking at GR violations. If you do this test, you have for free uh, ultralight dark matter searches and you, you push these bounds by uh, 1 to 0.5 to 3 orders of magnitude. You also do a test of quantum mechanics, which is very involving, and you can just do all of this up to this GRW point. So these are secondary objectives, but we think they were very interesting. We had all of this community on board. I uh, don't have time to show this. Just a final slide. This is a paper that we put on archive this week um, just to show that all of this is, is reasonable. We did the math and we did um, study these interferometers theoretically. Uh, on their shaky platforms, and we compared what we would need for 10 to minus 15, what we need for 10 to the minus 17. Um, the conclusion is that if you compare this to a microscope uh, platform, these numbers are uh, lower in all cases, in, in, or uh, these numbers are more relaxed for our EP tests than for microscope, which means that the technology of the satellites is nowadays allowing to embark this interferometer and to have this measurement at that level. All right, this is my conclusion. Um, so we are exploring these two axes, basically um, increasing the sensitivity with large momentum transfer. We, uh, several recent advances in space, it's starting to be a history of almost 20 years now of quantum gases in space. It starts to be major. We are um, hoping that we can reach um, very competitive levels in, in, 
in testing fundamental theories, and we are very welcome to discuss. Uh, there are plenty of initiatives right now at the DLR, but also at the ESA level, they are open to collaborations with NASA. So if you, the science communities are talking, and I'm very uh, happy to discuss this further at the end. I'd like to thank my uh, theory team in Hanover, the consortia I evolved at since a couple of years now, and thank you for your attention. Thank you for the nice talk. Other questions? Yes, yeah, so fantastic talk, Mr. Thank you. Um, one question I, I had uh, was regarding the, the matter you mentioned earlier about the intensity balance between the two arms for block oscillation, atom interferometers. I was wondering, are there any games one could play to ease the requirements with some of these light shift or AC stark shift compensation techniques by engineering the spectrum, maybe if, if you have a sideband with a different detuning at a certain ratio that shares the intensity fluctuation spatial mode. I was curious if you think that might, if you thought about that or think that could help with this particular yes, uh, application. Yeah, absolutely. So you could, you could do this, uh, but you have to be careful that you are doing this compensation the same on the two arms to that level. So the message is rather now there is uh, this analytical formula or this analytical tool, one could use it to, to devise strategies. You could also think about differential uh, operations, uh, gray geometric uh, kind of measurements, where you could also relax this further. But uh, this is like uh, the, the, the right angle to look at things, I believe. Yeah. Thank you. Very, very nice talk. I have a question. I don't know if it's the theory of the block oscillations. When you go to a very shallow lattice, then you have a lot of states in the continuum. So how are your simulations affected by the box size? Uh, okay. So, our, so you mean in the shallow regime now? Yes, when you have only two, but uh, typically in order to co account for the loss rate of the, when the lifetime of the states that are leaking, uh, when we were, we are doing simulations, typically you have to con account for a lot of continuum states to mm -hmm. account for the correct, but um, lifetime, but this is sensitive to the box size or if there is a, an additional confinement. Um, yeah. The, the uh, next one, I think mm -hmm. it's the next one. I think um, the next slide. You mean? Uh, yes, this one, when you were doing the simulations of the full model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we typically try to, to have um, simulations over quite an extensive, extended mm -hmm. range. And as I said, if you are in this lattice frame here, uh, you usually do not, uh, do not want to, to go very far anyway. So I don't know uh, how to answer your question exactly, but if we, if we look at the uh, numerical model to, to solve yes, this. Yes, in, in the numerical model. Mm -hmm. In the numerical model, we take a safety margin of a couple of yes, but tens mm -hmm. of sites. And, uh, mm -hmm. So F Florian um, uh, has to, had to take into account these absorbing boundary conditions. Yeah. yeah. So in, uh, yeah. We, because we uh, we saw atoms coming back, <laughs> and then we saw the interference, and we noticed okay, we have to put absorbing boundary conditions, and then you can treat them. So. No. So no, no, we, we, it's free space. Yeah, uh, thanks Clemens, yeah, that's, that was uh, helping indeed. Any further question? So I want to talk about the, the sort of differential, you know, fluctuations that led to this um, loss of, co of, of coherence time. Um, and you said, well, if there are, if there are fluctuations or jitter, um, what, what's the relevant time scale of those jitters? Is this a jitter from one shot to the next, or is this jitter within a single So in the, in the Holger's measurement here, he had, um, he doesn't, his, his, his shot is a ma one minute. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it, it's the jitter within. Within one minute. Within and, one minute. And is there, is there a part of the free frequency spectrum that actually matters? In other words, like, um, I could imagine that there might be some frequency jitter 
that is slow or some jitter at a frequency that's slow compared to some kind of radial trap period. You might go, well, I just idiomatically follow that and it doesn't matter. So is it high frequency jitter relative to some characteristic scale? Like where in my frequency spectrum should I worry? So what we tried here, the numbers that we plugged are just simple jitters of the optical axis of the lattice, nothing more. But during a single hold. During a single hold. We expect also transverse effects to kick in as well, yeah, and other frequency problems. But this, I mean, this jitter that we took from his paper was enough to explain at this level of control the loss of contrast after one minute. But just to be clear, is this sort of this delta phi, this is not like a global fluctuation, i.e. I lose track of my phase. It means actually when I hit it with my final pi over two pulse in the system, I will not see, I will just see a flat line. I won't see large fluctuations in spin up versus spin down in this kind of pseudo spin or, you know, momentum, one momentum state versus the other. Yeah, so this is, I would call this, this is a phase fluctuation then. Yeah, it's just that if I map, if I scan the phase of the final pi over two pulse, you could imagine I still have large fluctuations in the number I measure in one momentum state versus the other, even out to a very long time. You say, well, I've lost track of the phase, right? But nevertheless, I can see fluctuations. Or you could just see, no, no, like on every single shot, it's 50-50, right? Even as you scan the phase of that final pi over two pulse, or you just repeat it. Just trying to distinguish between sort of a collective dephasing mechanism, which people think about in optical clocks, and a single particle dephasing mechanism where, no, each individual atom is getting out of phase with its neighbors. I'm just trying to understand which this is. So I would say this is, this would be a single atom effect. And they're all doing it differently? And they are doing differently, yes. Oh, okay. So, I mean, these kinds of interferometers are still not using any many body property, yeah? So this is this is a single atom effect. And this is well, basically... But in clocks, for instance, if your local oscillator drifts, every single atom sees the same drift of the local oscillator. Mm -hmm. That's all I meant by collective phasing. Not, not that the atoms are interacting with each other. It's okay. just that your local oscillator gets on global phase shift and all the atoms see the same phase shift. So, yeah, I would say they would all see the same phase shift, but this would... So Holger is modeling that numerically by doing Monte Carlo simulations of classical trajectories yeah. in the Gaussian potential. And because it's Gaussian, they, even when they start from, from a point, you know, they diverge. And then he, he infers from the classical trajectories the, the, the phase, the action, and that gives rise to the phasing between atoms. Thank you, Nasser. Now, I have a simple question. I'm curious if any kind of squeezing in this block oscillation can help sensitivity? Maybe squeezing phase? Squeezing will help for sure, yes. How? Because, of course, squeezing number, of course, it goes much worse, right? Because you lose phase coherence. So maybe you have to anti-squeeze the number, I don't know. I did not think in this direction, to be honest. Uh, it would be interesting. But I, I think, I don't know. Okay. Be interesting. Yes, we, we can talk about this. Okay. I think we can close the session for today. Thank you, and thanks for the speakers.